ask you the same question I asked the kids. Have you ever needed a break? Maybe you need one right now. You needed to just take a vacation and get away for a while, to disconnect from the regular routines of life that just seem to be bearing down on you. And even if you love the work that you do and you're doing wonderful things, you still need a break sometimes, as the kids so correctly put it. We need rest, right? Now, the days that make me think I need a break when I'm uh, working, I call these my gas station days. And I call them that because all the pressure and stress of the pastoral work get me thinking that manning a cash register at a gas station wouldn't be such a bad gig. I clock in and work, and when I clock out, I go home and the work stays there and doesn't follow me anywhere. Does that desire sound familiar to any of you? Do you have work days like that where you just are exhausted and you just want a little break, a little pause? Or maybe it's not work that's causing it. Maybe it's family life or a relationship where you have to give a lot and you just need rest. Well, there's another element to our exhaustion as Christians that's not as easily identified. You see, in our relationship with God, as we seek out to carry His will out in our vocations, we sometimes get confronted with the problems of our own lives, the needs of the people who are coming to us, and on our worst days, we just envision all of the problems of our sinful and broken world. Because when we are called in service to Christ as His people... We are now working against the world, and that battle can wear you out and grind you down. And often, you get in the midst of this battle, and you regularly come up against problems that are just too big for you to deal with, needs that you can't meet, problems that you cannot provide solutions to, no matter how hard you try. Well, today in our text on the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6, Jesus' disciples are having a day like this, a day with both types of exhaustion. So let's look at how Jesus handles those things, and maybe we can glean some wisdom for ourselves on how to deal with our gas station days. Now, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle other than the resurrection that is in all four Gospels. But in each Gospel, the author has a different focus on the event, which is pretty true when you have multiple eyewitnesses to a single event. They all recount it a little bit differently, focusing on different things. And in Mark, the emphasis is on the state of the disciples and their interaction with Jesus. The miracle itself is just sort of the thing that makes the point that's been building up the whole time. Now, the disciples start out in our text excited but exhausted. They come back. They've just returned, right? Remember a few weeks ago, Jesus is rejected in Nazareth, and His response to that rejection is to be even more gracious and send His disciples to share the good news of the kingdom in the surrounding countryside. And He tells them, you know, don't carry any extra stuff, don't bring any food with you, no money bag no extra tunic, and just rely on the goodwill of those whom you will teach and preach the Word to. Well, they just got back, and they're telling Jesus all about the experience they had, all the things that they taught, the demons they cast out. It must have been a pretty incredible experience for them. But Jesus, upon hearing them, has a curious response. He doesn't say, great job, way to go, you guys did such a, such a wonderful job. Instead, his first response is this, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. He could tell they needed a break. They were exhausted. After all, this is the first time that he has asked them to take an active role alongside him in the ministry he has come to do. Before, Jesus has been bearing the burden alone, And his disciples have just been following him around and receiving from him. 
And now we know why they need to get away and rest, because it says, for many were coming and going, and then they had no leisure even to eat. Have you ever had a day like that, where you look up in the clock, it's like 2.30, and you haven't eaten your lunch yet? Because there's just so many things that have to get done, that list that never ends. So this is how we know they are tired. Now, when Jesus goes to a desolate place in the Gospels, He always goes there to rest Himself and to pray and to be with God. And because His church workers, His first sending out of His church workers, are joining Him in this mission, they too need to join Him as they go to a desolate place to rest and pray. But things don't work out so smoothly. Because all of these people, they are in desperate need. They know what Jesus can do. They know what His disciples can do. So they're not going to let them off the hook. They get in the boat to go to the desolate place, but people see them while they're in the boat and as they're going and they recognize them and they see where they're heading and they get there on foot before they arrive so that when they get off the boat, they're confronted by a great crowd. And I think one of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture takes place here, verse 34 of chapter 6. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. Now remember the context, right? They're tired. They're trying to find a place to rest. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. How wonderful is that to hear from our God? the incarnate Son of God, bringing His disciples to a place of rest and Himself, confronted by a great crowd in deep need, many of whom are probably there just because they know He can maybe heal someone they care about or themselves. And He doesn't get angry. He doesn't say, go away. He has compassion on them. But I imagine at this point, the disciples aren't Jesus. And so I'm trying to figure out what their thinking is as they get off this boat and see these thousands of people waiting for them. They've got to be thinking, maybe like you would think if you're on your way out at the end of a work day, and right before you get to the door, your boss calls out to you and gives you another thing to do. It's like the day that never ends. When am I going to get a break? Not only are you exhausted, but you've started to just taste. You can even see and feel the relief you're about to experience by getting away, and it pulls you back in. But Jesus, He sees the great crowd and has compassion, and so begins another session of taxing, ministry, care, and teaching. And we know this goes on for a while because the disciples don't show up again until they say, Jesus, the hour is getting pretty late. And then they say, why don't you send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat? Because it's a desolate place. There's nothing for them to eat here. And really, in the words of the disciples, I think what they're saying is, it's it's time to be done, right? Right? And that seems like a reasonable suggestion given the circumstance, right? There's no possible way. There's so many people. And why would they have the responsibility of giving them something to eat in the first place, right? They all chose to ruin their rest time and come into this desolate place and fill it with people and all their needs and all their whining and all their complaining. So send them away so they can go get something to eat. Then Jesus' response probably shocks them quite a bit. Because he just turns to them and says, you give them something to eat. I remember the first time I read that, I didn't really think much of it. And then as I was going through the text, I thought that that line got weirder and weirder, given the context of our story. Twelve disciples, they're exhausted. They were looking for a place to rest. And they offer, I think, a pretty reasonable suggestion. Let these people go so they can go get some food for themselves. And then Jesus just bluntly says to them, well, you give them something to eat. 
And so I imagine the tone of their response is something like, huh? So we're going to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? Like, what are you thinking, Jesus? And just for some context, that would be over half a year's worth of wages spent to buy food, which, of course, they don't have that, right? They don't even have two tunics, remember? So here we get to the second type of exhaustion I referred to before, the kind when the task that God gives to us and the brokenness of our lives and that of those around us is so great, we just can't do it. Because after the disciples have their remark, I'm sure they realize, oh, Jesus isn't joking here. And then they're like, there's no way I can do that. How are we going to be able to do this? So here at the end of verse 37, the disciples, they've reached their limits. They've done everything they can do, and they just can't do anything about this problem. The need of the people, the task of feeding them is just too big for them to handle which is why they throw out their preposterous suggestion about spending over half a year's worth of wages to buy them food, because they can't, the, the suggestion is so outlandish, they can't believe that Jesus is serious about it. It made me recall a time in Bible class when I first got here at Ascension, and we were going through the catechism together, and we got to partway through the commandments, and at one point, somebody just threw their hands up in the air I think it was Ron Curcio. And he was like, but we can't not do those things. And my response was, yeah, that's the point. Jesus didn't give them this suggestion so that it would leave him in despair over the fact that they couldn't do the thing that he asked, but in order to get them to stop relying on themselves and instead turn to him. So how does he handle it? They ask them how much food they already have, and between the twelve, they've got five loaves of bread and two fish. That's not going to make a dent. So they're probably wondering, what is he doing? But when another, another interesting thing happens in the text here is that the disciples are no longer really a separate group. They now are part of the large crowd of people who need something from Jesus. The verse goes on, it says, Then He commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. The crowd and the disciples, they both have the same great need, and only one person can meet it. Then Jesus blesses and breaks the bread and the fish, and with the disciples distributing, feeds this massive crowd of people. And they all eat and are satisfied. So it's not that it would be amazing enough if everybody got a piece but that's not the way the grace of Jesus works. Just as it was exhibited earlier that even though He's on His way to rest with His disciples, this massive needy crowd is met with compassion because they're like sheep without a shepherd. So He fills them full, so full that there are baskets left over of food. Now, we know the truth of this in our own lives when we've come across insurmountable things and when the grace of God makes its presence known, it is abundant, it is overflowing, and there's plenty to spare. So what should we do when our service to God asks us to give the equivalent of a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children something to eat? Because I think even by today's standards, if you yourself had to feed that crowd, or even if a group of 12 of us had to feed that crowd, we wouldn't be able to afford it. We wouldn't be able to do it. Well, when our limits are reached, Jesus is just getting started. If we feel that the problem is too large for us to tackle, the need of the people is too great, it's probably because it's true. But it's also true that that means it's not actually your task to undertake. It's a task that belongs to God, and you can place it in His hands, just like Jesus takes this matter into His hands and provides all that's needed and more. 
So are you having one of those days like the disciples are having where you can't get any reprieve, where you're worn out and the things that you feel that God is asking you to do, you just can't do them. They're too big, they're too hard, they're too overwhelming. Did the troubles of life, work, family, or faith follow you here today, this morning? Not only did you not get rest, but the work continued until you got to the point where you couldn't do it. And you're left thinking, how can I find rest? Every time I try to find rest, a great big crowd shows up. And you're not looking just for the physical kind of rest, but something more, something that would free you from all the pressures of the problems of your own sin, the problems of the brokenness in the world and in your own families, because even if you take a vacation, some of those things you just can't get away from. Well, our text today tells us, give those to Jesus. When you've hit your limit, Jesus is just getting started. Out there in the world, you are His disciples. He has sent you in your vocations to bear witness to Him and tell others about the good news of the kingdom. So you do have work to do. But here in His house, we, like the disciples, become part of that crowd in need. We're all one group that have a need so great that only one person can meet it. We need to be taken care of. There are so many of our own needs, that much less other people's, that we can't meet. So many tasks that we can't accomplish. That's why each and every Sunday here, I emphasize letting go of those things and resting in the work of God every Sunday. It's so easy for us to even turn this into something about us and the things we do. And as soon as we do that, we rob it of all of its power. Instead of receiving the gracious work of God to and for you, you turn it into your own, and very soon we end up in the same place, at the edge of our limits, the big problems not dealt with, the big needs unmet, still broken. So in our gospel reading today, it is an incredible miracle. It really is. I mean, I would be amazed if I saw that. Jesus feeding 10,000 or more people with five loaves of bread and two fish. But as great as that miracle is, it is a mere shadow of the real reason He came. It's a mere shadow of the reason that He did that in the first place. It was to point us to the greater work of provision that He was going to do. The offering of His own body and blood on the cross. You see, as amazing as the feeding of the 5,000 is, every single Sunday when you're invited here to God's house, you participate in an even more amazing meal at communion. The fulfillment of this abundant, gracious work of a loving God. So, dear friends in Christ, rest in Him today. Rest not because your work is done and not because you have made it, but rest in Jesus because He has completed the work. He has saved you. He has saved the world. So rest in Him knowing that when you hit your limits, He's just getting started. In the name of Jesus. Amen.